right. Again, thanks to everyone coming. We've got a good turnout today. And let's jump right in. So our first speaker is going to be Gabe Shenhar. He's the Associate Director of the Consumer Reports Auto Test Center. And he's going to be telling a little bit about the basics of UGVs. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. And uh, <clears throat> let's uh, see the, uh, the uh, are you uh, going through the slides, Mackenzie? Or if you'd like, yes, I can one, share. Right? Sorry, I one moment. Let me share the screen. All right, wonderful. So uh, again, uh, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> nice turnout, uh, 80, 90 people here. Uh, again, I'm uh, Gabe Shanhar, Associate Director for Auto Test Program at uh, Consumer Reports uh, Auto Test Center in Connecticut. And I've been the uh, point person for anything that has to do with EVs for the last 12 years uh, when we first started uh, testing EVs in earnest in 2011. Uh, okay, next slide, please. First. Thanks. Um, let me uh, just, uh, I know that Consumer Reports is a household name, but uh, nonetheless, uh, let me just uh, go over a few uh, important points here. We have about 6 million paying subscribers between the web and the magazine. We have 13 million unique monthly visitors to our website. Uh, and uh, we, of course, are a nonprofit organization. We buy all the products we test. A lot of people uh, <clears throat> don't believe we actually buy the cars we test, but we, we do. We, uh, of course, do not accept advertising, and we have our own test track in Connecticut. Um, we are very much uh, data-driven and uh, evidence-driven. We like uh, data, um, and uh, we also survey, uh, other than testing, we survey our, our subscribers for reliability and owner satisfaction, and we test and evaluate in a very consistent, repeatable manner um, we uh, definitely embrace anything alternative fuel, but uh, as long as it's practical for consumers. And over the last 12 years, we definitely uh, have increased uh, the public awareness of EVs and other alt fuel technologies beyond just the early adapters. And uh, to date, we've tested just about every major EV available in the US market, including um, plug in hybrids. Next slide, please. Here is an aerial shot of our beautiful test track uh, facility in Connecticut, uh, which uh, resembles in many ways uh, a manufacturer's proving ground. All right, let's uh, continue with the next slide, please. All right, so uh, <clears throat> there are three main levels of electrification, which I'm um, going um, we'll go through. Uh, first is the hybrid, which uh, we'll explain later. The next uh, is a plug-in hybrid, uh, known in, in the business as a PHEV. And then we have battery electric vehicles, which are purely electric vehicles and are known in the industry as BEVs. Next, please. So the hybrid, uh, which uh, the most uh, <clears throat> iconic hybrid is out there is probably the Prius, uh, which has been around uh, for about 23 years. And it has an electric motor that uh, augments the gas engine that uh, the manufacturer can then uh, use a, a fairly small engine. And uh, it uh, hybrids allow for uh, electric alone propulsion uh, at low speeds, uh, at, uh, <clears throat> low demands with the uh, light foot on the throttle, particularly in uh, urban kind of uh, city environments up to about 25 miles per hour typically. 
depending on battery charge and, and, and other factors. So the, uh, the battery gets charged by the engine as well as by regenerative braking through coasting. And, um, and regenerative means that uh, basically the motor, the electric motor turns backwards and sends uh, energy back to the battery. Now, hybrids uh, never need to be plugged in, which is uh, might, might sound surprising to some. It was very surprising to us when we surveyed um, <clears throat> uh, people and uh, we're quite shocked to see that uh, about uh, 30, over 30 percent of uh, the public thinks that uh, hybrids need to be charged. Uh, not the case. They're always ready to go. And... You, they don't require any change of lifestyle. You just uh, get in the car, you drive, you fuel it up uh, at the gas station, just like any other car. And uh, you just benefit from a great uh, fuel economy and lower emissions. Next. The next uh, technology is plug-in hybrid, which is considered uh, a a transitionary kind of a technology between a hybrid and a pure EV. So these have a larger battery than a regular hybrid. They can drive on electric power for longer than a regular hybrid, typically between 20 and 50 miles. And uh, once that portion of uh, electric propulsion is depleted, they revert to regular hybrid operation. They can be charged overnight on regular 120 volt, uh, which uh, is uh, <clears throat> is fine for their small battery. And uh, you know you're you also have the gas engine, so you're not uh, exclusively relying on the electric power. Uh, but to benefit from uh, their uh, <clears throat> ability to uh, use their electric propulsion, customers will need to charge frequently, and uh, other benefits are that uh, they uh, qualify to be driven in uh, HOV lanes, uh, high occupancy uh, vehicle lanes, and they qualify for uh, some federal and local tax incentives. Now let's uh, switch to uh, pure EVs now. So uh, battery electric vehicles or BEVs, they have no internal combustion engine at all. They don't consume a drop of fuel, have zero tail, tailpipe emissions. They rely on a large uh, battery that powers an electric drive. And uh, they have a short, shorter range than uh, ICE cars. Uh, typically nowadays, 250 uh, seems to be the normal, as opposed to gas cars that uh, have over 400 miles uh, typical range. Uh, and it, it, it takes, uh, instead of uh, taking five minutes to charge, uh, to fuel a gas tank, they take hours to charge um, on uh, 240 volt. We'll get into that. Here is a picture of a, a Tesla screen showing about half uh, a battery that's half full and still has nearly four hours uh, to reach uh, full charge. Next slide, please. So a few things that everyone should be familiar with uh, when uh, looking at uh, EVs. So uh, there are three charging levels. Uh, level one is a regular 120 volt household. Uh, that's uh, gonna be good for about three to four miles of range per hour of charging, which is uh, doable in some cases, but uh, for most EVs, it's, it's pretty untenable. Level two is 240 volts, and uh, that typically will uh, pump in between 20 and 35 miles of range per hour of charging, depending on the uh, amperage that uh, the charger is on. And uh, plug types, uh, uh, there are maybe three main uh, types of, uh, of, of plugs. The ubiquitous uh, J1772 is an SAE standard. And that, that's used for all EVs except for Teslas uh, for level one and level two. And then we have the SAE combo or CCS, uh, which is a combined charging system. That's the second one uh, from the top. And that's used for fast charging, uh, DC fast charging. Uh, 
Another uh, standard is the Chatemo. It's only for Japan. There are some uh, Nissan Leaf and uh, some Mitsubishi EVs that uh, have that kind of plug. It's uh, it's hard to find. It's uh, being phased out. And uh, and then there's the Tesla uh, plug, which uh, has its own uh, kind of plug and used for both uh, DC fast charging as well as uh, level two charging. Um, next, please. Let's go over some of the uh, appropriate uh, uses for the different levels of charging. So level one, uh, that uh, <clears throat> might be sufficient for a plug-in hybrid that has a small battery, can typically charge overnight. Level two is the uh, the most uh, uh, the predominant way that most people charge. Uh, over eighty percent of EV owners charge at home uh, with uh, with a home charger. Uh, there are also uh, level two public chargers that you might find in uh, hotels, train stations, libraries, supermarkets, uh, and whatnot, and uh, they will give you the same type of uh, of uh, <clears throat> charge level that the home charger will give you, but they're uh, they're designed to be uh, commercial grade and uh, in many cases designed to charge you for that. Now the DC fast charging, that's uh, faster charging, and uh, that's uh, the appropriate uh, way to charge an EV on a long drive. Um, it uh, <clears throat> typically adds about 150 miles in about 30 minutes. Um, now, and now when, when we, we talk about supercharging, uh, <clears throat> then uh, there is Tesla, and then there is all the rest. Uh, because for Teslas, you uh, line up to the charger, you plug it in, and, and no questions asked, no futzing with an app, no uh, uh, no credit card. It just starts charging immediately. It's the most seamless kind of way. And also, the locations of uh, Tesla superchargers are just off uh, highways and rest areas places where you'd want to stop anyway. Other um, EVs have to rely on on other public charging uh, networks, um, uh, most notably Electrify America. We'll get to that in the next uh, <clears throat> slide. All right, first, uh, let's go over some of the uh, <clears throat> home charging. So as we have already established, most EV owners uh, charge at home. Uh, there is plenty of research uh, regarding that. The home charger uh, can be either plugged in or hardwired, it can be indoors or outside. And uh, it's very convenient to just uh, plug in at night. Uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, owners benefit from off-peak rates. We've evaluated uh, several uh, home chargers and uh, feel free to uh, go to our website and uh, and see our uh, review. Uh, we first we got uh, uh, kind of a feel from from actual owners what they uh, about features they like, such as length of cord, the smoothness of the coupler going in and out, and some convenience features. Cost range range ranges between three hundred and seven hundred hours. An installation uh, can go between 500 and 1200. Now, homes with uh, uh, that uh, comply with current code that uh, have a 200 amp uh, service or simpler, my uh, home charger costs only uh, $320 to install. My electrician uh, <clears throat> said that uh, it wasn't his first rodeo. Now, in terms of cost, uh, charging. Uh, uh, a 60 kilowatt hour battery will will cost about uh, based on the average national average of uh, 16 and a half cents per kilowatt hour will cost less than ten dollars uh, and yield about uh, 180 miles of range. So of course that's going to be more in some uh, northeastern and California locales where uh, electricity is 26 cents a kilowatt hour. And it's going to be less in other places like in Texas, where it's uh, 13 cents or less even. Next.
All right. So the public charging. Um, so as we said, uh, there's Tesla and uh, there are the rest of them. And uh, we'll uh, we'll focus uh, for a second on uh, the rest of uh, public charging infrastructure, which is uh, still in its infancy. And uh, the most uh, prominent uh, networks are, they're gonna, you're going to see out there are Electrify America or ChargePoint. Um, most modern EVs can take about 150 miles of uh, range uh, <clears throat> in 30 minutes. And um, um, the cost is uh, 43 cents per kilowatt hour at an Electrify America. They have a uniform uh, um, price uh, nationwide, unlike Tesla, which uh, tends to be more expensive in, in California or other places where gas is also more expensive. Uh, here's an example of uh, filling uh, a Mustang, Mustang Mach-E from 30% to 8%, um, which uh, took in 150, 151 miles and cost $21. Now, it's worth noting that uh, DC fast uh, charge uh, places are not exactly like uh, gas stations. They have no restrooms. Uh, you have to rely on nearby businesses. They have uh, no handy squeegee to... Uh, clean your windshield or uh, trash cans to get rid of uh, some some typical uh, trash you tend to collect on a long trip. Next slide, please. Now, charging speed, uh, we here is, uh, <clears throat> I'll share uh, some of the work we've been uh, doing uh, regarding EVs. And uh, recently we took four popular EVs, the, um, <clears throat> the Ford uh, Mustang Mach-E, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, uh, Tesla Model Y, and the VW ID4. And uh, on two different days, about a month apart. And uh, so it, uh, the charging speed will depend on the maximum acceptance rate that an EV can take. And there are variations in charging speed depending on location, the load, uh, whether or not there are other EVs uh, charging next to you and temperature. So as you can see from the graph here, uh, the, the Hyundai, Hyundai and Tesla uh, were able to charge uh, at the fastest rate. But uh, when we talk about used EVs, uh, most of them are capable of only charging at uh, up to 50 kilowatts. So. Uh, you're going to see uh, uh, lower, uh, slower speeds, even in DC fast charging places. Next. Another thing to uh, consider is uh, range. And uh, range in uh, an EV is not, uh, it's a moving target. There is no, uh, there is no real... Uh, hard and fast uh, kind of figure here. It depends on temperature, on the terrain, on the driving style. And um, we found uh, that uh, frigid temperatures, uh, and I'm talking frigid uh, New England temperatures of uh, 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And we found that uh, that would cut the range between 25 and 32%. Um, here uh, in the infographic, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the trend was consistent among all EVs. The shortest range was in cold weather uh, and mild weather. Uh, the frigid compared to the mild is 25% is, is less, but the frigid weather compared to warm, a typical summer day of uh, mid 80s um, <clears throat> yielded the, the, the longest range uh, in all four of them. Next. Now, uh, there are uh, definitely cost considerations, and uh, without a doubt, uh, you're going to uh, be saving run on running costs. You're going to be saving uh, uh, with an EV compared to a, a gas car, and uh, I'll go uh, through that more in detail pretty soon. Uh, there are lower maintenance costs, uh, there are no, no oil changes, no spark plugs, no tune-ups, uh, none of that. Of course, you still have to replace tires and wipers and uh, pollen filters and, and those kind of things in an EV, but uh, <clears throat> there are much fewer moving parts and uh, it's basically a simple kind of a device. Um, 
one of the barriers uh, for uh, EV adaptation has been uh, the difference in cost, uh, when new at least. So here are two examples of uh, the same car that's uh, available in the gas and electric version. So there's about an $11,000 difference between a Hyundai Kona gas and the electric. Next, next, please. Here is a comparison of uh, two of those two Hyundai Konas. And uh, you can see uh, the range is longer, of course, with the gas one, uh, the refueling time or charging time, uh, <clears throat> big difference there. And in terms of uh, <clears throat> consumption, 26 miles per gallon versus about three and a half miles per kilowatt hour, which is the equivalent of about 120 miles per gallon. The EV is of course uh, more powerful and uh, a lot quicker in terms of the zero to 60 acceleration. But, um, and let's uh, go right down to the cost uh, per mile. So uh, you see 12.7 uh, cents per mile with the gas version as opposed to 4.6 cents per mile with the EV. And uh, on an annual basis, um, if you look at that difference, uh, you can see that there is almost a thousand dollar advantage in the Delta annual cost between the EV and the gas version. So that's a uh, major savings. And uh, over the life, uh, typical life of a car, uh, owners might save about $10,000 Typical life of a car, we mean uh, 200,000 miles and 10 years of ownership. Next, please. So uh, when buying a used EV, there, then uh, <clears throat> uh, there is, uh, according to the New Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that uh, tax uh, incentive uh, gets extended to used EVs, which wasn't the case. And that means uh, now we're in 2023. So even 2021 model years uh, are gonna qualify for that. Car has to cost less than $25,000, has to have a battery size of at least seven kilowatt hours. So that means uh, most uh, EVs and plug-in hybrids, but no hybrids. And the car has to be bought from a dealer. Adjusted gross income uh, may not exceed 150,000 uh, for a couple and 75,000 for uh, um, a single filing, um, not filing jointly. And starting in 24, dealers will be able to claim the credit and pass it on to consumers at the point of sale, which currently is not the case. Buyers have to claim the credit themselves. Um, there's uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, added details in the site uh, in this uh, URL that I included here on the IRS uh, site. Next, please. Other EV uh, considerations when you buy used, uh, they uh, they can be a bargain. Uh, EVs, uh, <clears throat> because of the $7,500 uh, tax credit when they're new, that gets folded into their depreciation right away. So you can find a lot of uh, uh, fairly uh, late model year EVs uh, for reasonable prices. And uh, here is an example of uh, a 2019 Nissan Leaf can be had for about 23 thousand uh, dollars there are some concerns we hear from a lot of people's uh, battery capacity uh, it wanes over time according to data we have so far it's about uh, 10 to 20 percent over 10 years battery replacement is uh, extremely rare uh, as far as we can tell and but individual battery cells can be replaced um, <clears throat> on a, on a need uh, basis because uh, the, there is an ability to uh, zero in on a, on a cell that uh, is underperforming and uh, those can be replaced individually. Current EV warranties run to uh, about 100,000 miles and they can be transferable to the next owner. So that, uh, <clears throat> but in order to be uh, really sure about the specific model, uh, buyers will have to uh, research that um, in in detail and uh, if an ev is not for you consider a plug-in hybrid like the toyota prius prime for instance which will give you um, uh, some um, <clears throat> sections of uh, of your trip if you have particularly if you have uh, 
a short commute and you have the ability to charge frequently, then you can benefit uh, most of your uh, daily routine can be uh, uh, driven on electric power. And then uh, once you're on a long trip, you don't have to worry about uh, where to charge and, uh, and how long uh, to stop uh, on the way. Also, another uh, new feature is uh, you can get a free battery health report uh, on uh, Recurrent, and uh, it's a pretty slick app. You can feed in the VIN number and uh, upload a, a few pictures, and uh, you'll get the, the, the health of the battery and uh, the expected typical range, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I, I highly recommend. Thanks, please. So uh, to, in order to find uh, an EV, uh, there are some uh, used car sites like CarGurus and AutoTrader. And uh, here are some specific examples uh, that, are, uh, that I uh, <clears throat> included here. Uh, these are <clears throat> up to date. Uh, as of yesterday, these cars are all available. And, uh, and uh, that's a great opportunity for anyone to uh, to drive an EV for uh, and benefit from uh, the latest uh, um, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, now, something else to keep in mind, uh, in March, there is going to be an update and a few additional um, components to, the, uh, to that act. And uh, so let's stay tuned. Next. And... Uh, that is uh, that concludes my presentation, and uh, now I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Oh, um, we're actually going to save the questions to the end. Um, as my, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A, and we are going to get to them once all our speakers are done. We are very excited to answer them, but we're just going to let everyone present first. And now we're going to have Ellie Picho um, from Plug in America. Let me know when you're ready, Mackenzie. Oh, uh, everything, you're good to go. Okay, um, if you could put it on presenter mode, that would be great for a presentation. Oh, it is on presenter mode. I think there's a lag. Okay, all right, perfect. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, my name is Ellie Peichel and I am a policy specialist at Plug in America. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Sorry, <laughs> I think there is a little bit of a lag. If you could tell me maybe when it uh, hits the next slide, that would be great. It's on the next slide. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there is a lag. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so our agenda for today, we're talking about used electric vehicles. First, I'm gonna go over what we do at Plug in America. And then I am going to discuss the federal and state incentives available for used electric vehicles. Then I'll talk about things to consider when you are in the market for a used electric vehicle, the lifespan of an EV battery, and then at the end of a battery's life, what are the pathways available? So if you could go to the next slide, please. Mackenzie, this is Craig Van Battenberg. Click on slideshow at the top and then click on first slide and you'll get to where you wanna be. Do you see that Mackenzie? It says yeah. animations, home, uh, insert design, transition, head over to slideshow and hit your cursor there for just a second. Yeah, I'm and sorry, also, I am actually in slideshow. I think there might be an issue with the streaming. I'm gonna stop yeah, the share and restart to, and see if that fixes it. You might have to enable editing as well, at least from what I can see on my end. Thanks, Craig. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you, Mackenzie. 
Yeah, thank you for your patience, folks. It'll be just a second. All right, let me know if everyone sees it. Yay, all right, that looks good to me. Um, Lovely. That looks good to everyone else, thanks so much. Um, so Plug in America, what we do. Uh, Plug in America is a nonprofit advocacy group for EV consumers across the country. Our mission, or our mission is to accelerate the shift to electrified transportation in a way that is both equitable and just. We help consumers, policymakers, auto manufacturers, and other populations to understand the benefits of driving electric. So we strive to provide practical, objective information to help consumers select the best plug-in vehicle for their lifestyles and needs. Plug-in America also founded ENDU, or National Drive Electric Week, which is the world's largest celebration of plug-in vehicles. If you could go to the next slide, please. Awesome. So I wanted to start off talking about the importance of developing the used EV market. Currently, transportation is the largest contributor to climate changing emissions, and that means that electric vehicles are a critical component for not only reducing the sector's emissions, but also for setting us on the path to reach our climate goals. While EVs do help combat climate change to meet our sustainability goals, we have to look beyond replacing every ICE vehicle with a new EV. The bottom line is that we have to keep EVs on the road for as long as possible, no matter how many times they change hands. So again, although EVs are a lot more sustainable than their ICE counterparts, the, they still have impacts associated with mineral extraction, and production processes as they are a manufactured product. So in developing the used vehicle market, we are working to keep these vehicles on the road and then also working to make sure that this transition is accessible for everyone. Um, in 2019, I believe, yeah, 2019, around 70% of the vehicles sold in the United States were used. So as the EV market continues to develop, when people are looking to buy an, buy an electric vehicle, they will most likely try to buy it pre-owned and will have a greater opportunity to do so. So later in my presentation, I'm going to touch on the, uh, or maybe in the next slide actually, <laughs> um, additional tools that are being offered at the federal and the state level that are used or being used to shrink the affordability gap for EVs. So if you could go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, so my co-panelist, Gabe, touched upon this, but I think it's just important to reiterate because there are a lot of different details. Um, you may have heard about the clean vehicle tax credits that are part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, in this presentation, I will be focusing on the used clean vehicle tax credit that went into place on the 1st of January and is expected to be in effect until the, sorry, um, until its expiration in 2032. Um, a quick note about the language I will be using moving forward. Although fuel cell vehicles are eligible for the tax credits, in this presentation, I will be focusing on how these tax credits pertain to electric vehicles. Thus, I will use electric vehicles to mean both plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and fully electric vehicles. 
when I need to differentiate between the two, I will. Otherwise, EVs just mean both of them. Um, so luckily, the requirements for used vehicles are a lot more straightforward than those needed to qualify for the new vehicle tax credit. They don't feature any sourcing requirements related to critical batter or critical minerals, battery components, or final assembly. A lot more straightforward. The first requirement is that the used vehicle must be at least two years old. So if a vehicle is new from 2022 and it's being resold this year, it would not qualify for the used vehicle tax credit. The second vehicle requirement is a purchase price of under 25,000. And then the third and final requirement for vehicles is that it must be sold by a dealer. That means if your, let's say, uncle or neighbor down the street is selling their used EV, it would unfortunately not qualify for the tax credit because it must be through a dealership. There are also, along with the vehicle requirements, requirements for the consumer. Um, there are income caps that the consumer must fall at or below to be eligible for the used EV tax credit. They include um, 150,000 for joint return or su surviving spouse, 112,000 for head of household, and then $75,000 for individuals. So you might be wondering, how does the government determine the credit amount that you receive? So it is the lesser amount of either $4,000 or 30% of the vehicle price. So if your vehicle is more than $13,300, you will re be receiving a $4,000 tax credit. If it is less than that, then you will be receiving 30% of the vehicle price. And then regarding financing, the consumer is responsible for financing the upfront cost of the used vehicle. How a tax credit functions is that it deducts the credit amount from your taxes, but is unfortunately not just money in your pocket. Um, a, point of, a point of purchase credit, which Gabe also mentioned that's coming in 2024, which some people call money off the hood, basically takes money directly off the sticker price of the vehicle instead of waiting for tax refunds. Um, that being said, we don't yet have federal guidance on this, so I won't go too much more into it. And Mackenzie, if you could please go to the next slide. All right, there are a few other details to note in regards to the tax credit. The first is that the purchaser cannot be the original user of the vehicle. That seems obvious, but it's a, it's a loophole that they're meaning to address, um, which means that you cannot, or this means that you can only get the used EV tax credit on a vehicle that is considered new to you. So you can't lease a vehicle for six months and then try to buy it and redeem the used EV tax credit. You can still buy it, but you won't get the credit. That makes sense. Um, the next thing to note is that if you are considered a dependent on another person's tax return, you are not eligible to claim the credit. Um, another thing to note is the taxpayer can only use the used clean vehicle credit once every three years. So if you buy a used EV and use the credit and then buy another used EV a year later, you're not able to use the credit. You have to wait that three year span. Um, only individuals qualify for the tax credit, which means businesses are not eligible. And then the last thing is that each vehicle is only eligible for the used EV tax credit once. So next slide, please. Now we have state used EV incentives. So along with the federal used clean <laughs> EV tax credit, um, there are six states that offer rebates for buying used EVs. These states include Maine, Connecticut, Illinois, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Oregon. I think that's six. Um, unlike tax credits, you do not have to owe a certain amount of, in taxes to 
achieve the entire incentive. So any consumer can take advantage of these rebates. Um, these state-based rebates, it's actually pretty great, can be used in addition to the federal used EV tax credit, so they can be stacked, um, which is awesome. And if you could go to the next slide. So after looking at the rebates offered by these six states, I flushed out three different general types of used EV rebate categories based on who they are available for. Some states offer a rebate to those who live in the state, simple as that. For instance, Illinois. If you live in Illinois and are a resident of Illinois, you therefore qualify for the used EV rebate. Then there are states like Oregon and Maine, I believe, yes, um, that offer a rebate for those who are low and moderate income. This group of people can also be classified as those who participate in a state or federal income-based program, like let's say SNAP. And then there are other states like Rhode Island that offer both. And what I mean by that is they have a base rebate um, for all state residents and then additional money for low and moderate income people. Something to generally note about all of these different state rebates is that the vehicle and consumer qualifications necessary to be eligible for these re rebates vary by state. And so do the rebate timings, like the timing in which you get your money back. So for the sake of time and simplicity, I will not be going into the mechanics of each one. That being said, if you would like more information on um, these different rebates, you can visit plugstar.com. There you can type in your zip code, easy, boom, 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 and see a list of all the incentives that are potentially available to you. So if you could please go to the next slide. <laughs> Along with Plugstar, we have some additional resources. So for general information on the tax credit, my colleague put together this awesome resource page that can answer a lot of your questions. And then if you have any remaining questions about anything electric vehicles, you can um, achieve some one-on-one -on -one assistance by contacting our EV support program of the number listed on the slide. So I think you could go to the next. All right, so here are some things to consider when you are in the market for a used EV, because going to a dealership can be daunting, especially with the newness of EVs. The really awesome thing, or one of the really awesome things about electric vehicles is that they have fewer moving parts that can break or fail. So the main concern you have with your electric vehicle is the battery. When you visit a dealership, other things to check are the general condition of the car, the brakes, and the tires. Um, although the manufacturer warranty varies by automaker and is something you wanna check when you go to a dealership, Federal law actually requires automakers to ensure both EV and hybrid batteries for at least eight years or 100,000 miles. To put this into some kind of context or perspective, the average ICE vehicle drivetrain warranty is five years or 60,000 miles. So, you know, EVs are expected to last a lot longer just through that lens. Um, so, when you're looking at a car, um, you can ask an experienced EV mechanic or dealer to perform an onboard diagnostics check to measure the health of the battery. Something to note is that even if a used EV battery capacity is not at 100%, uh, it can still meet a lot of your needs for driving and lifestyle needs because the range declines at such a slow rate so it's yeah it's usually still pretty good um and then yeah if you could go to the next slide please okay so an ev battery is expected to be able to power a vehicle from anywhere to from anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 miles so Let's say your battery lifespan is 200,000 miles. 
that means you can go from Los Angeles to New York and back and then do that again. So twice in a year for 17 years, and then your battery will start to kick out. That's 12,000 miles per year, which is a, a pretty long time. And that's pretty good. And that's because the average decline in energy storage in an EV battery is 2.3% per year. Um, initially, it's a little steep, but then in subsequent years, it starts to slow down. So that means for an EV with a 150 mile range, that means 150 miles before you have to charge it again, you're likely to only lose 17 miles of accessible range after driving it for five years. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, did it skip the slide? Oh, no, we're good. Sorry about that. Um, so while EVs deliver major climate emission benefits compared to gasoline vehicles, the recycling and reuse of EV batteries is critical to ensuring that the transition to electric vehicles is actually sustainable over the long term. And I'll kind of go into what that actually means a little later in the slide. But before recycling batteries, um, but before recycling, batteries in good condition can be repurposed and used for a second life application. One of these is stationary storage. So second life applications are great because they extend the lifespan of an EV battery while also helping decarbonization efforts. So as more of our energy comes from renewables and you know, as climate impacts kind of threaten uh, our grid reliability, stationary storage is becoming a lot more necessary as a tool for backup. So that's great. Um, and then we have recycling. So when batteries are not good enough shape to be repurposed, they can still be recycled. And that's crucial for meeting our sustainability goals, kind of what I was alluding to um, when I first started this slide. And what I mean that by that is that when you recycle an EV battery, you can reuse all of those materials to create another EV battery. This is awesome because these recycled materials replace the need for newly mined materials, thus decreasing uh, the amount of mining necessary for the clean energy transition, which is uh, of great concern nowadays. And you can tell it's of great concern because there has recently been a lot of federal investment in programs for battery recycling and repurposing. And programs like these allow consumers to participate in the EV transition in the most sustainable and responsible way. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, all in all, developing a used EV market allows people like me who want to do good by both their wallets and the planet to participate in the EV transition. It helps us reduce air pollution and emissions, not only by replacing gas powered vehicles, but by taking advantage of the long lifespan of an EV and by keeping them on the road for longer. So. I mean, cleaner, reliable, and more affordable transportation should really be for everyone and should be accessible for everyone. And it's it's really neat to see federal and state governments taking notice of that and creating incentives that are making electrified transportation more accessible to all of the people that want to experience the benefits that come from driving EV. So that is the end of my transport or oh my gosh the end of my presentation thank you very much <laughs> thank you so much ellie and now we once i get his slides up um we are going to have um craig van battenberg of acdc talking with us and then after that we will have time for everyone's lovely questions that they're putting in the q a so let me just share that. 
призываемый. And do you see the slides? I see slides, but I need to get it to the point where you're looking at the slide and not the back. There you perfect. Lovely. All right. Yeah, there's a little bit of a lag, but okay. So I'll introduce myself if that's okay, Mackenzie. Yep, go right ahead. All right, you hear me okay? So uh, my background is fixing automobiles. And uh, so what, I, what I've been able to do over the last 45 years is run three companies. First was an independent shop in Worcester, Massachusetts, fixing Hondas, 1977 to 2004. In 1999, Massachusetts started a new emissions program where we checked emissions by putting your car on a set of rollers. And that little NSX up there, it's not mine, is at the Automotive Career Development Center across the street from the shop. You can see the shop. And we did emissions training for nine years in Massachusetts. The other picture, that little funny looking Honda inside an Auto Inc. magazine, that's my car. Uh, I love electric cars and hybrid cars, and I'm a big Honda fan. So I went out and bought that Insight October 15th, 1999, was built in December of 99, picked it up in January of 2000 and started another business doing hybrid training. So I'm running three businesses. My wife is wondering what's going on. So we shut down everything except hybrid training in 2004. Next slide. So I'm actually in that building. So this is, that's myself with the long hair. Uh, those are two students and that's a Chevy Volt battery pack and we're wearing protective clothing and we're doing a class here at my old repair shop, maybe two years ago on what's going on with Chevy Volt battery packs. We have 47 hybrid electric cars outside, 17 different ones. Next slide. And if you're an automotive technician turned EV instructor, really get to have some fun. So last year we bought a Zero uh, SRF. That's a very fast electric motorcycle. My background is motorcycles. And then we bought that used Tesla Model 3. The reason why we purchased it last year is there's not enough service on Teslas. They're having trouble keeping up. So now uh, Tesla is allowing the aftermarket to get involved. So we can get parts, not all of them, a bit some. And we can now get a factory scan tool. So what's happening at our business here in Worcester, Massachusetts is a lot of Tesla classes. We service the aftermarket. Next slide. I guess that's coming. There we go. So I work with Green Energy Consumers Alliance in Massachusetts as a volunteer. And that's our logo for our shop. And some of the slides you're looking at were produced by Green Energy. So just wanted to give them a little credit for helping me with this slide presentation. Next slide. So this is from Green Energy. You're looking at an automobile engine on an assembly line that's getting ready to go into a car. 400 moving parts, maybe 500, depending on the engine. All those parts over there you see listed, maybe you don't know what they are. There's a little bit of a mistake here. It says drive shaft, that's not right. There's a drive shaft on all electric cars. I didn't do the slide, but it's close. There's just a lot of things you don't need. And so it does make the car a lot simpler. Next slide. So you're just looking at a, an empty battery pack and you're looking at one in a car. And so here at our training center, we have a lift table. We've actually built it. It's about 1500 pounds you can hold, which is everything that we own, but they're getting bigger. If you wanna go further, you put more cells in the battery pack or you make the car more efficient. Next slide. By the way, if you buy a car that has a plug on the side, it's a lithium ion battery, no exceptions. It's just an evolution. If you go back, we have a 2011 Leaf, which is actually the first year it came out, 83, 84 miles of range tops. And you can see as time has gone by, we've been able to add more range by making batteries more efficient, by making batteries smaller. And this is just an idea how far Nissan has come. Next slide. Now, when you go to buy tires, Make sure you go to a tire store that understands EVs. And 
Michelin, and there's lots of other brands, make specific tires for electric cars. Now, there's a downside. Our Model 3, our Kia EV, Nero 2019, the Nissan Leaf. My motorcycle is relatively new. I haven't burned the tires up on that yet. Then we have a Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid electric. They wear tires out faster than an average gas car. One is they're heavier, but there's so much torque. And you're, if, if you're like me, you'll kind of like to go fast occasionally, you're probably going to be replacing the tires every 20 to 30,000 miles. So if you're used to getting a set of tires on your Prius to go 50 or 60,000, that's probably not going to happen, but you need to get special tires. Electric cars are very quiet. So now they have acoustic tires, which means there's foam rubber inside to make the tire more quiet when it's driving down the highway. And so tires can be expensive. You don't have to use acoustic tires. You can replace them with regular EV tires, but most people want the quietest ride they can get. Next slide. Now, if you're buying a used EV, I know you've been talking about this a lot. There is dashboards you can look at. There's scan tools that we own here we can look at. There was that free app uh, that was mentioned earlier, but clearly, and it's been stated and it's absolutely true, you don't want to buy an EV that doesn't have the range that you need. We have a consumer website. I'll get to that later in the slide. I got a phone call from this poor woman down in Baltimore who wanted to be an Uber driver. She bought a used EV. It had 14 miles of range. She bought it used, didn't have it checked out. The car needs a $10,000 battery replacement, which really just almost put her out of business. So you don't want to make that mistake. You want to make sure that you find the right shop that has the right equipment that's been trained in this and they can give you the best estimate that they can that the battery pack that you're buying the used one still has a lot of usable life in it one thing i can tell you battery packs last longer when they're either liquid cooled or cooled with an air conditioning system i'm trying to try to, i'm going to try to keep this very uh brand neutral so i'm just talking in general terms next slide so the next slide you're going to see is a battery that has 54 miles of range, but you see that zero to one, that is a capacity meter. And normally they're not shown on dashboards, but this particular car, it actually shows it right on the dashboard. So if you saw that it had 30% of the battery pack is worn out, you can still buy the car, but you're going to get 54 miles of range under best conditions. I'm in Massachusetts, Worcester. It's cold out. We have one of these cars. And right now we're averaging about 35 miles of range tops because in the cold weather, it's getting hammered due to the way they're heating the cabin. Next slide. So it's buyer beware. And you all know that if you ever bought a used car, any used car, you want to take it for a test drive. You want to make sure everything works. This is, there's nothing new here. The trick now is finding a competent technician. I don't use the word mechanic, by the way. We gave that up in 1975 when you become ASC certified as a technician. I don't care what you call us. Just so you know that the average technician would be, prefer to be called a technician and not a mechanic. At any rate, next slide, please. So we've already talked about level one and level two. I just want to add a few more things to this. Level one is a trickle charger. It usually comes with the car. Some cars now it's an option. It's going to take forever to charge an electric car. But if you're down at Cape Cod, you got an old beach house, you don't have any 220, you're going to be there for a week. You drive down the Cape from Worcester, you plug in your car, you wait about four days and you drive home and you just walk around the beach. That would work, not very practical. When you get to level two, there's 20 amp, 30 amp, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 amp level two chargers. If you want to future proof your purchase and put a level two charger at your home and you have that 200 uh, amp service at your house, then find a future proof charger. And the word EVSC is used in our industry, the repair industry. We call it electric vehicle supply equipment. What that person's holding is really an expensive extension cord. It's not a charge. We call it a charger. It's not. It's an extension cord that safely brings high voltage AC 110 or 220 to your car. And when you hold that in your hand, you're holding 12 volts, period. When you plug it in your car, the car has a little 5 volt 
and it goes over and they make a handshake. See where it says communication? That's a communication link between the extension cord, the EVSE that you call the charger, and the charger that's actually in the car. If you bought an electric car in 2011 or 2012, it needed about 20 amps of 220. The charger in the car was 3.3 kilowatts of power that it could charge the battery up with. And that 83 miles of range on a leaf, it took about eight hours overnight on a 220. If you buy a brand new Cadillac Lyric that came out about six months ago, that is a gigantic charger inside the car. So you need a level two at about 50 to 60 amps. And now I'm going to get over 55 miles of range every hour it's plugged in at my house. So when you're shopping for level two, besides the cost of having it installed, please do a little bit of shopping, shop around, and make sure you're buying a quality product, UL approved. There are some chargers out there from other countries that are actually probably not as safe as they could be. So I'd go with a name brand, level two, and if you can afford it, buy an 80 amp level two, because as these electric cars get better and better, they're going to want to have more current, more amps going into that cord, that extension cord, so your car can charge at the rate the dealership said it would charge at. So you have an old level two from 2011, put a Cadillac Lyric in it, it will work. But instead of charging at 54 or 55 miles per hour, you're probably going to get maybe 12 miles of charge per hour. Next slide. So when you buy this home charger, and again, I'm repeating myself here, make sure it's future proof. Next slide. DC fast charge. I know this has already been covered. That big thing on your screen, I guess it's on your left, that's got the handle on the bottom. That was the first real fast charger. They're legacy. They're about 50 amps, as was said, and they are going away. But there's a fair amount of those on the West Coast. We have them on the East Coast. And electric cars came in, except for Tesla, in model year 2011. And they are phasing out. The one on your right hand side, this shows the plug in a little socket below it. That's CCS combined charging system. And that's pretty good. But I, and we have a lot of cars. I drive them around and I charge them up at public stations. I agree with everybody, every panelist so far about the charging network. The one in the bottom in the middle, that's Tesla. And like I mentioned, uh, we bought a Model 3, a 2020, and I had to take a business trip to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm in Worcester, Mass. And it's a fairly new Tesla for us. So my wife and I hop in the car, we put in the GPS coordinates, it gets me all the way to Cincinnati. Along the way, it's telling me where to charge and there'll be plenty of charging stations. Twice I had to wait about a half an hour. When I get to the charging station on the Tesla, the battery pack should be about 70 degrees Fahrenheit to accept the charge, a fast charge. So it'll, re it'll uh, precondition the battery pack while you're driving to the station because it knows you're going there and try to get the temperature either higher or lower. So there's heaters for batteries and there's air conditioning for batteries, depending on the temperature outside. It's really great. When I show up, I've got about 200 kilowatts and then it starts to decrease after 20 minutes because the battery is getting hot and I can't control the temperatures. And this has been in the cold because it's cold now and it was also in extreme heat. So those are your different DC fast chargers. It's often called level three. Level three is actually an SAE standard that was put together, but was never used. In fact, if you want to get technical, which is not why we're here, that Tesla charging port on the bottom is the closest to level three you'll see, because the other ones have to have an extra set of pins for the DC, for the fast charging. That Tesla connector is quite unique. Interesting that Tesla's done that, because it can accept DC or AC both. Next slide, please. So if you want to find a technician, and I'm a technician, you want to find someone who's ASE certified, Automotive Servicing Excellence, in hybrid vehicles. So you call a shop, you have an ASE L3. L3 is the certification. That's a book I've written back in 2015 when that L3 designation came out. Technicians do not have to take the test. It's optional. But that's a good source to find out, is that technician trained and have they passed a test? If you go to hybridshoplocator.com, 
It's a website that we support. We put it up there and we list the qualified shops that ACDC has trained that are certified to work on your car from us along with ASC certification would be optional for them. In the United States of America, there's no licensing for technicians. It would be nice if there is, there just isn't. So for consumers, you have to be a little more careful than maybe if you're in the Netherlands, where I will be in, in March doing some training and also some training in Spain, where there's some licensing, but this just isn't here. You want to visit the shop before you even buy the vehicle. So find a shop in your area, independent or dealership, I think they're all terrific. Make sure that shop's going to be able to service what you need and then buy the automobile, the electric car that matches the shop. Visit the shop before you buy it. Check it out. Try to be friendly. You know, I think I was a shop owner for 26 years. One time only ever in 26 years, a person came in that moved to Worcester from out of state, walked in my door and said, are you ASC certified? Can I meet your technicians? I was blown away. Most everybody who ever called me on the phone to get their Honda fixed, the first question was, how much, how much, how much? If I was a doctor and told you what was wrong with you over the phone, I'd be sued for malpractice. So if you want to get an EV checked out, you really have to go there, leave your car, make sure you like the people there, it's competent, and wait for their diagnosis. I teach management courses to shop owners on how to deal with customers. We do love you, but we want you to behave maybe a little bit better than you are right now. At least that's my opinion. Next slide, please. This is a preventive maintenance schedule. Back in June of last year, I finished a five-year project. And that project was to make a college-level textbook from scratch based on all the things that I know, and I know a lot, and put it in technicians' terms so they could get trained. In Massachusetts, if you check the Boston Globe, Massachusetts has just awarded us a lot of money to put together a plan to, to take every EV technician in the state that has an environmental justice claim, which means minority, women, low income, bring them to our training center for two weeks and get them fully trained in EVs. Right now we're in the planning stages. If the state of Massachusetts says we like the idea, that will probably get fully funded and we'll be very busy for about three years. I'm gonna brag about the state for just a minute. We have a new governor, and the first thing Maura Healy did, our new governor, was to make another office in Boston for climate change. The first act, the first thing that was done. The state's doing pretty well. We're 21% one, we're solar. That may be the highest in the nation. We have no coal-fired plant. The last one got shut down in Seekonk. We leveled the building, and now we're building blades for offshore wind. I love living in this state. There's a lot of cool things about it. And this is my general maintenance schedule for any EV you would have. Next slide, please. So we're just about to the end. All those technologies you're looking at have been used and there's things on top of that. I do wanna make a comment about fuel cells. So I was looking through all the chat. Our college level textbook is 22 chapters, 450 pages, five years of work. I hired a former trainer from Toyota who did not wanna to move to Texas because so they moved to Texas. I'll just mention his first name, Rick. I had him write the fuel cell chapter for two reasons. One, he loves fuel cells. He thinks they're the greatest thing you've ever seen. I don't. So I think there's a downside in fuel cells that's not quite where we wanna be. And I read all the comments. I realized we have somebody out there. I'll just give you the first name, Steve, who's totally into fuel cells. Um, feel free to go to our website. It's fix hybrid, F-I-X hybrid or fixev.com and check that out. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions, I realize maybe now it's question time because I'm the last presenter. There may be one more slide, I'm not sure. Let's see if there's another slide here. I don't remember. Yeah, so thanks for your attention. That's our company, ACDC, Automotive Career Development Center in Worcester or Worcester, Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Craig. And yes, it is time for questions. So we've got just a few minutes. Um, Left in the left in the webinar, and so I'm going to pick some questions out of the Q and A, um, read them out, and Craig, Ellie, and Gabe, whoever wants to jump on it, can go first. But um, the first one is one someone asked earlier, and they asked, "Do rapid chargers farm battery capacity?" And I'm going to add on to that. Just it might be good to mention sort of what effect, how much effect, how much 
a certain amount of fast charging affects battery capacity because it's sort of taken as a given that people are going to use it occasionally, but sort of maybe if, maybe discussing like how much is too much, sort of what levels you should keep it at might be good. Greg, if you don't want this one, I can field it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, most manufacturers uh, suggest uh, do not uh, fill your battery to over 80%. Also, uh, when you're uh, in a fast charging situation, DC fast charging, most people, according to a research by UC Davis, most people arrive at a DC fast charging with about 30% state of charge in the battery and leave with 80% because once the battery reaches 80%, the charging slows down considerably and uh, you might as well um, hit the road again. And um, Craig, if you want to fill in uh, anything more technical. Uh, yeah, well, it's not so technical, but when you do DC fast charging a lot, Mary Barra, who runs General Motors, says, do it all you want. We have no issues with our GM cars. Other companies will say something else. But what you really want to do is put it on a level two charger occasionally because there's some technology to balance all the cells in that battery pack that there is turned off during fast charging because the current's going in too quickly. So if you only fast charge, it's you won't have too much trouble, but your battery's happier to even a level one charger, level two. Now, if you live in an apartment building and the landlord doesn't have chargers, you're kind of in trouble. There's a lot of work being done in most states, I think. In our state, if you're building a parking lot, you have to put in the tubing next to the infrastructure so you can put in the chargers later without tearing up your parking lot. There's a lot of building codes we have here. And besides that, we're trying to go renewable. So it depends on if you have enough money and you have a garage and you have your own driveway, you're great. That's not everybody. But yeah, DC fast charging, you avoid it at all costs. But if you're going to go long distances, then you're going to use it. And we have a long way to go, I think, for apartment dwellers and people without their own houses to get this fixed. Another question that people, someone had was, speaking of battery life, someone asked, can your driving style increase your battery life? Yeah, I think so. Anybody else want to take this question? Greg, I think you're the most qualified. Well, well so I have this key. I think so too. Yeah, I have this Kia Nero EV. My wife loves it. She drives it. It's her favorite car. I drove it to work today because we're, we're teaching a class and I wanted to bring it in and show it. So when I drive it, there's three levels on the dash. One is normal. What is it? No, one's eco, normal and aggressive. So I drive through traffic. I'm not a hot rodder at my age, but I noticed when I got to work today, I had like 7% aggressive driving. My wife never has aggressive driving. So I'm pulling more current out of the battery in my driving style than my wife, who's being much more calm behind the wheel. So I think to some degree, it's probably a very small amount. But obviously, energy going in the battery quickly is going to hurt it. Taking it out quickly is going to hurt it. So if you're a jackrabbit driver on and you have a Tesla Plaid that goes 0 to 60 in 1.99 seconds, which I've had the fun of driving it in in that crazy launch mode. Yeah, it's going to hurt the bat. It has to. But also, we didn't talk about new batteries coming up. So very briefly, when we actually get to an electrolyte, we're getting technical here, that's made of a ceramic, which we can do pacemakers. If you have a pacemaker, sorry for you, but the pacemaker is handmade, and that's a ceramic lithium-ion battery because they, they won't explode inside your chest. That's not a good thing. To make that commercially and put them in EVs, we can't do it. We have the technology, but we can't commercialize it because we can't do this on an assembly line. That's the holy grail. When we get to batteries, lithium batteries, with a solid electrolyte made of ceramic, no more fires, faster charging, runs cooler. And we're there, internal combustion is over. We're not there yet. Stay tuned. Somebody else asked, um, again, on the topics of batteries, but somebody else asked about battery fires, which I know have been like in the news a decent amount. So maybe just an idea of sort of how that happens, if it can be prevented, how worried should people be? Ellie, you want to jump in here? You studied that part? I 
I think it would be good for you to take this one, Craig, please. <laughs> Thank so you. there's a company called MGA up in Wisconsin that I've worked for. They're the ones who test cars for a five-star rating before the government tests it to make sure that that car, that prototype is going to be safe enough to be sold. Interesting company. They have a facility in New York State they built maybe five years ago. It's five stories high. Their job is to take a battery pack five stories high and drop it on the ground, put it in a vice that will crush this thing. It's a fireproof building. So there's lots of work being done in a moderate crash to make sure nothing ever happens. Now there's 18 fires every hour in the United States with gasoline catching on fire in your car. Probably do it yourselfers that don't know how to put a fuel filter in, who knows what. And we've had what, eight fires on the highway tops ever? So I guess the news, it's its the clickbait. You know, click on that thing. So he's going to get rich, right? So are they, yes, they're dangerous. But the number one source of a technician dying in a shop is having a drop light with an incandescent bulb coming in the morning. They've had a gasoline tank leak a little bit. Gasoline's heavier than air. It's combustible. They drop the drop light. It breaks and they blow up the building and their head hits the back of the wall at such speed they die of a head concussion. Number one cause of death. Gasoline is so much more dangerous than a battery will ever be. If you know Fast and Furious, Paul Walker, unfortunately, I think it was November of 2014, Paul Walker driving with his buddy, Roger Rodas, out in California, took a really fast Porsche and made one simple mistake going too fast, hit something, and they were raising money for kids at the time, which was such a shame. And the car, the, the tank ruptured, there was a big lawsuit. The tank ruptured, it filled the cockpit with, with gasoline, and then there was a spark. I didn't want to tell you what, how horrible that was. And it caused ripple effects. Um, so gasoline is by far the most dangerous thing we've ever had. If you tried to build a gasoline car today, I'm going to strap gasoline under a car in a steel tank and go 80 miles down a highway, the government would never allow it. Too dangerous. But it's a legacy. It's been around 120 years. It has other negative effects like climate change and other little possibilities. So yes, everything's dangerous. I work on, I have a lift downstairs. We have a couple of lifts here. They're dangerous. So technicians have to mitigate. I'll tell you, I don't want to mention the brand. There's a car being recalled right now. And I happen to have, she goes see my eye doctor last week in Worcester. And I know he drives this plug-in hybrid. And he's been in the shop for 10 months. And the dealership was told by the manufacturer, fast charge it as fast as you can. If the battery doesn't catch on fire, give it back to the customer. What? The dealerships, I'm not doing that. I don't have a place to plug a car in anywhere and have it catch on fire. I don't want it catching on fire in my lot. Now, that's a manufacturer you wouldn't want to buy a car from, probably. So we're at the early stages of this battery stuff. And we have to do it. We don't have a choice. Is it the best solution? Probably not. Is it our only solution other than fuel cells? Yes. So we'll, it's like every technology we've ever done. We build it. We screw it up, we fix it, and we screw it up again, and we fix it again, and we try to get something to work. Look at the – my grandfather, Ed Finnegan, was born in Washington, D.C. in 1894, dropped out in the fifth grade and got a job at an electric car company because in 1902, the most popular cars were electric. His job was to tow them back with a team of horses when they ran out of juice and lead acid batteries. So – we have to stay with this. It's going to be a problem. There's a lot of downside. We're trying to make it an upside, but we just can't keep putting gasoline in your fuel tank. It doesn't work. So there's, there's, it'll get better. Have me back here in 10 years. We'll see what's going on. All right. Let's do one last question, and then it looks like we're nearing the end. Um, so last one. Someone earlier asked um, if sort of about the danger of being stranded. And what they asked was, if I run out of power, can AAA charge my car? But what I would also add on is just sort of how does one avoid being stranded? And like sort of what does a car do to alert you to that? And what can be done to avoid that situation? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, yeah, we've, uh, <clears throat> I mean, in our experience, we've got, 
gotten pretty close to uh, getting stranded with an EV. Luckily, uh, most uh, EVs will give you advance warning, uh, a couple of stages. Uh, typically, when you get to about uh, 20 miles of range uh, or <clears throat> or so, uh, I know a Chevy Bolt will uh, start uh, reducing propulsion po power with 15 miles left in the range. So it gives you, uh, and, and there are multiple warnings, uh, <clears throat> make sure you charge as soon as you can. So it uh, takes a real effort to really get stuck in an EV. And, uh, and once you uh, get used to driving EVs, uh, you kind of get a feel for the distances you cover. You get a feel for the range you're getting uh, in different days and different temperatures. And, uh, it, and you know where, where and for how long you're going to charge so it, it becomes a built-in there's a whole paradigm shift when you uh, move from a gas car to an ev and so uh it uh, part of it is uh is uh, <clears throat> psychological it uh, but it uh, gets uh, you you get it gets built into your uh <clears throat> psyche and uh <clears throat> mo can i add to that mckenzie it's just a funny story. There's a company in Australia called Club Assist. You've never heard of Club Assist. Club Assist trains AAAs all around the world on doing service calls. In Australia, if you're out in the back, they're going to go out and put a starter motor in or an alternator. So it's an interesting company. I had some work to do with them. So AAA was worried. It's 2011, 2010. The leaf is coming out. What do I do? So they built these little wagons that they'd hitch on the back of their truck. And in that wagon, there was a diesel generator that powered a level two charger. So if your leaf, or because that was the only one out in 2011, was stuck on the side with no power, they'd come over and they'd charge it up with enough range to get to the charging station. Just like they bring you three gallons of gas, they don't fill your tank, so you can get to a gas station. The first time they used these, they made a half a dozen, put them around the country. The first time they used, the first person they went to, the person ran out of power, they call AAA. AAA comes out with a diesel generator. Guess what this person said? You're not charging my electric car with a diesel generator and refused to have them use it. They scrapped the whole program. Then they went back and got a lithium ion battery packs that will work to charge your car. Now they go out. So this, yeah, AAA has something. Uh, now they go out with lithium ion battery packs that were charged hopefully with green energy to charge up your electric car. They didn't want to mess up your carbon footprint. I, I kind of have both sides of that story in my brain, like funny, not funny. Uh, yeah, so they're working on it. Absolutely. AAA, Paul, I forget his last name, in Rhode Island is our local AAA fellow. I did something like this for them not long ago, a little chat group. So, yeah, they'll work on it. And I totally agree with Gabe. My wife, I love my wife, Deb. She's wonderful. She takes the little Nissan Leaf. We bought it. She's out shopping in Worcester. It's a cold day. She calls me. I've only got eight miles of range, Craig. I said, you're two miles from the house. How bad could it be? Well, she had to run a few more errands. I live on the top of a hill. <laughs> she starts going up the hill and the thing just conks out completely. So she puts the Flurry flashes on. Tr I'm not home. She trudges up the hill in the snow. We get a tow truck. I have a picture of this. They back it into my driveway. But what's interesting, and this is good for consumers to know, the flashers drain the 12 volt battery a lot. So when I went to plug it in, it wouldn't charge. Your 12 volt battery must be fully charged in order for your charger to work. So I went down the shop, got my jumper box, went back to my house in a snowstorm, jumped the 12 volt battery, plugged it in. And when you're charging your big battery, it charges the little battery at the same time. My wife never ran out of power again. One time. Everybody I know runs out once and that's it. They start watching to see what's going on. So that, I would add that as well. Personally, I think anybody who doesn't drive an electric car now should really, really consider it. Uh, they're there. They're, the technology has come so far. I want to add one more thing. When I bought my Chevy Volt brand new at 38 miles of range and a $10,000 battery, we leased a Chevy Bolt, B-O-L-T, the electric one. And seven years later, the same cost got me 238 miles of range. So the battery technology has come down 80%. So the average $25,000 brand new electric car has over 200 miles of range. I wanted to add one more thing from my notes. If you're living in a cold climate, buy an electric car, if it's new, with a heat pump. 
Just ask, how do I heat the cabin? He don't, and if you like, if you go to SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, and Google my name, you'll find an article I wrote. It's in their magazine. It's free. You read a whole article I've written a couple, maybe a year and a half ago about heat pumps, if you like the technology. But heating your car with a heat pump gives you a lot more range in the wintertime than heating it by heating hot water. There's three types of heating systems. So the heat pump would be great, a little more money, but in cold climates, it's great. You don't need it in Florida, but you need it in Mass. You're out of New York, is that right, Mackenzie? I am actually also out of Massachusetts. I'm just Wonderful. about two hours uh, west of you, Craig. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Anyway, so that's just another little tip. And um, yeah, I'm done. Nice job, Mackenzie. Yes, thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge and experience. I feel like this has been very educational for me, and I hope it was for everyone attending. Um, slides and a recording and our written tip guide are going to be sent to everyone via email. If you are a feed, you're going to get them sometime tomorrow. They'll also be on our website. That's also going to be in the email, so do not worry. You'll be able to view it again. Um, yeah, thank you so much to everyone who came and thank you so much to our panelists for presenting. Um, I hope that everyone has a great night. Thank, thank you, you for all. hosting. Thank, thank you very you. much.